ladies. It's good to be joining you on this virtual meeting of uh, the Africa Women in Media 2020. I am Sarah Bidemisho and I'm a fellow from 2019. I happen to be in Nairobi, Kenya for the 2019 meeting. Today I'm joining you from Andaria Magazine with two of our founders, Omnia and Salma, and they will be answering some of your quest of our questions. Maybe they will help us relate to digital and storytelling especially during the time of crisis, during wars, during instabilities, and maybe even the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, most, uh, most media houses have had to shift to digital media, but we are glad to have been there before everyone else came to join us. So we want to talk to you, we want to tell you how we have managed to go through this, uh, these challenges, even before the pandemic, the challenges that have been here before. Andaria is in Uganda, we are in Sudan, we are in South Sudan, and you know this, uh, countries like in Sudan, we, we've had some um, uh, conflict, especially the one that took uh, the, the president out of power. And Andrea did a very crucial role during uh, those uh, demonstrations. So we are going to be seeing how digital storytelling uh, played a role in such a crisis. So ladies, welcome to this session. It will be at least 15 minutes. Uh, uh, we are going to hear from Salma. Salma will tell us what inspired her and Omunia to start Andrea magazine. So Salma, up to you. Hello Sarah, and um, I'm glad that Andrea is um, part of the OM uh, virtual um, conference in 2020. Last year we had the chance to attend. It was more than amazing and hopefully we'll be able to join in person next year when all of this is over. So back to your question. Um, when we um, uh, thought of uh, creating a platform, uh, Omni and I, back in 2014, um, we were actually addressing a gap of the lack of um, positive news about Sudan and South Sudan. There was there was not um, a platform that tells our nar narrative by, by uh, most of the time what we were faced with or what we were presented with, especially as the diaspora not living in Sudan, is um, that many of these stories are told about us and they are not necessarily in the right spot or it's not the right way. So uh, we thought that this is something that really we 100% need to address. And the other issue was the secession of Sudan and South Sudan. In 2011, uh, South Sudan has gained their independence. However, we were left with like, um, a, um, like a, a big gap in terms of like the genera generations that are to come. They're not um, gonna learn much that we, we, at one point we were one nation, we had so many things in common. So in a sense, we wanted this, the peace that happened between Sudan and South Sudan not to be a negative peace. We wanted to continue the dialogue, have people engage with each other, learn so much about, about us and them, and that we're not so different. So this is the place where Andrea came. Uh, we started uh, as a digital magazine. We, um, we were very fortunate in a sense that we uh, were able to publish like quarterly magazine issues until we kind of uh, like formed our to uh, publish weekly articles from various content. We were able to grow our network of contributors up to 120, correct me if I'm wrong. And um, yeah, I think um, this is how Andrea started. And then time and time we see this uh, same narrative as being uh, is the is, uh, same thing with Uganda and uh, so on. So we plan to be more pan-African as we continue to grow. Yep. Thank you so much, Salma. Um, now, in the wake of the Sudan uprising, what role did digital media and storytelling play? If, if you could take us through Omnia. I think the biggest thing was that digital media really had to replace a lot of media that was shut down during that uh, period of the revolution. Um, there was a massive crackdown on media to stifle any sort of information about the uh, protests that uh, started small and then grew and exploded into the entire country. Um, and the whole time until April when this government, when the previous government of Omar al-Bashir fell down and was toppled, um, there was a lot of resistance and, and, and massive crackdown on media and also activists to try to stifle that movement and that information flow. So digital media took the role of that and um, through digital activists and through citizen journalists, uh, we were able to um, relay information uh, on social media, not just as platforms such as uh, Andaria, but also as 
independent civ uh, citizen journalists, uh, they were able to relay that information on social media. They also used it as a, a verification tool to verify images, information, uh, videos, everything that was coming through uh, to make sure that the information was legitimate, was verified, was um, uh, true so that uh, the movement itself was not um, invalidated or compromised in that way. So digital media played a really important role. Another thing was to mobilize diaspora, was to mobilize international movements, to sympathize, support, and ally themselves with the movement. Um, it was months and months long, so the it was a very winded road, and digital media continued to kind of push forth um, messages of, of support and, and allies uh, were able to then propagate that again on social media. So people who here thought that they were isolated and they were uh, fighting this fight on their own were uh, reinforced with enthusiasm and support from international you know, people from all over the world uh, who were able to support them through digital media. So it, it, it played a very critical role, not just in making sure that the movement stays strong and authentic, but also to connect the movement to other allies and to ensure that it um, maintained this momentum online and it stayed on the major news uh, portals throughout the revolution. After even the toppling of Omar al-Bashir um, at the time when people had a, a, were in the sit-in, and then after that, um, when the uh, June 3rd massacre happened and there was a media shutdown, a digital media sh shutdown, um, and people had to try to use other methods to get the information out to diaspora who can then relay that information. And once the, the, the road was open again for digital media, um, so many messages came on online to just uh, explain how uh, it happened, the, the June 3rd and, and the aftermath. And until today, digital media plays such a critical role um, to ensure that there's information flow and to rally for certain causes where people can understand who is fighting what and how can we ally with them and how can we support them. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, the, next, the next question actually I feel like it touches most of uh, the African countries, especially in this region. Uh, usually we have so many people misrepresenting Africa as a country where people are poor, people are broke, people, people are always hungry. But um, as Andrea Magazine, how have you dealt with this misrepresentation, especially of Sudan and the region as a whole? Uh, when it comes to, to the to the media, because even uh, sometimes you read an article in an international uh, media written by someone from by an international journalist, and it's talking about your country, and everything is a lie. So, what have you done to to help with this misrepresentation of, of Africa and maybe Sudan in particular? So as Selma mentioned, really the reason we started Andrea was because we were so tired of seeing misrepresentations of the country. And we're also conscious that a lot more people are coming online back then when we started in 2015. Um, and essentially Andrea is a, is a tool that people can use to document what's happening at a certain point in time and also tell the story from, from the, the mouth of the person who's living it, who's experiencing it, who um, has the context in their blood. Um, so the, re the battle here is that the reach of something like Andaria compared to something like whichever um, international agency, um, news agency is, is, you can't even compare them. Um, definitely we're struggling with that reach, not even uh, one component being the sanctions, but also the scope of, of what we cover is very small compared to international media. Um, but we continue to remain uh, one of the integral pieces of, of documentation of, of certain events and, and happenings that have occurred over the last six years. Um, and the most important thing is that this is, is given through the people living these lived realities and these different um, experiences. Um, the issue with international media is that they have correspondence, whereas we don't just go to journalists, but we go for people who have opinions about something because they're immersed in that reality. Um, so the correspondence or the journalists who can kind of parachute in, report on something, and then parachute out and parachute into the next country is they lack the depth, they lack the, uh, the uh, empathy with the cause, and they lack the contextual analysis. Um, and not that we, we offer the most 
in-depth kind of analysis, but we offer the most contextually relevant analysis and by giving different people from different backgrounds um, the kind of the tools to then propagate these messages, we're enabling the conversation to go beyond just the moment uh, captures on social media, but to live on the internet so that it can be a reference um, created by us so that our history is not continuing to be written by someone else on our behalf. Um, and I, I believe that digital media is a huge tool for such uh, kind of, of, of revolution of where people write their own histories and they document their own events using their own tools, their own language, and then all of that lives to testify to that moment. Thank you. Uh, if I may add an, one example that really um, uh, shows how international media lacks context and actually not only lacks context, but they like to drive thing, uh, they, they perceive the thing and this is how they want to see it in reality. I'm not sure if you guys remember back in uh, uh, the story of Miriam, the Sudanese uh, lady who wanted to marry a Christian and her brothers were against it. Um, this is what everyone, uh, like this is what we're told in international media, this is what's actually, but the real issue with Miriam's story is that her brothers did not have an issue with her marrying a Christian. In fact, she was practicing, practicing Christianity for so long, but their main issue was that he is from a different tribe that's not ethnic, um, racially compared in their own, uh, obviously in their own perception. It's not, they don't think these people from that specific tribe are not good enough for them. So the issue was actually a racial issue. And when the local journalists reported that to the international media, they're like, no, we're not really buying that. It's a, it's a, it's a religious conflict and they don't want. So in a sense, like they neglected that angle. They pushed so hard for the difference to our there. So I think when we come to address our own stories, our real stories, we'll provide all the like different aspects, not necessarily fit into one propaganda or one direction. Hey, just to make the, just to make them, oh, they're so anti-Christianity. We don't want to hear it. Actually, they're, they're fine. They just where they had, they had their own racist issues happening. So yeah, this is just something that would be um, to share, yeah. Well, thank you so much, ladies. Um, now, one more thing. Uh, so many people are wondering how you have dealt with the challenges that come with, with uh, these conflicts and uprisings and internet shutdown. Um, I know there are so many countries where this is happening. It has happened in Tanzania recently during the presidential elections. Uganda is going into uh, general election next year, and I'm very sure this is going to happen because it happened in 2016 during our elections. Now, uh, as a journalist who may be watching this from Uganda or any other country where this is about to happen, could you give them tips on how to reach their, their, their online readers when the internet shuts down? What did you do during the, the Sudan uprising? How did you manage this? Please share with us, ladies. Uh, Omnia, do we go with you first? Yeah, just briefly, because um, we're running out of time. I, I think the most important thing is even when the internet is shut down, the documentation of human rights violations does not stop. Um, if anything, it becomes even more focused because at that point you're just documenting, you're not really sharing that much on a, a global scale, but you are sharing to the local communities. Um, what we've been through after, before the big shutdown of five weeks is we've had smaller shutdowns where people learn how to use VPN, for example. Um, they learn how to document things and make sure that even though you're not online, you're able to still document them with a timestamp and the date stamp and everything, uh, corroborate the different data that you have so that you're coming up with something that's uh, validated. But also the most important thing is to create networks on the ground that are able to communicate with each other despite this blockage. So going back to the good old text messaging and phone calls and just making sure that the, the offline networks are solid, they're connected, um, and they're able to, to, to talk to each other even though there's no um, online presence. But also mobilize so a diaspora populations who can then uh, be able to kind of keep an eye on the ground because they're able to call their families, call their friends, uh, know what's going on, and then um, spread the word. And there's a lot of uh, organizations such as Access Now, Chipeta, that are working towards um, enabling some activists to still have access to online channels even when there are shutdowns. This is something that it's, it looks like it's a lived reality. We just have to live with it, that they will continue to shut down the internet. And we have to prepare ourselves with the tools to then uh, be able to uh, still have some sort of access when we're offline uh, officially. Uh, over to you, Salma. Um, yeah, and if I may, may add another challenge, even when the 
internet is available is that most of like the way we share our content is on these platforms facebook twitter and instagram and uh, these platforms constantly change the algorithm so they make it so hard for your existing followers and or new followers to find out your content so your, your content really um is, is not something easy for them to uh, get exposed to so it would naturally advertise uh, like uh, on facebook for instance but however most of these platforms because of the sanctions we were limited and challenged to advertise to and do target people in sudan so this was a key challenge in helping us um grow in terms and becoming uh, and and uh, getting uh, our content exposure there it means however like i think things now look quite promising with the lifting sudan from the sponsoring terror list and hopefully that will be a result so it will help us going forward all right thank you so much ladies and to everyone at a whim a 2020 uh, digital of virtual meeting whatever it is we hope that you have picked something from our conversation from the experience of andrea magazine uh, my name is sarah Grimisha, and i've been with our two founders salma and omnia thank you so much for giving us a chance to share with you at Tawim. and uh, hopefully like salma said we shall be attending in person in 2021 Thanks, Sarah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Awim. We're very grateful Welcome. for this opportunity. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, ladies. Bye. You're welcome.